this way. Can you imagine having to coordinate 100 authors in various time slots over a three-day time period? Lee, how did you do it? <laughs> well, I guess I should give you a brief background. Um, I worked in the pub I've worked in the publishing industry for about now it's been about 11 years. I started with Caribou Bookstore, and I don't know if you remember Caribou Bookstore, but they were a chain of African-American bookstores in this area who had six stores. And when they closed down three years ago now, at that time, I had at that time worked with really over about 2,000 authors. And at that point, they didn't have an outlet, and they were looking for an outlet in terms of to promote their books and place to come and do discussions and book signings because with six stores, we really provided a um, complete access to African American literature. So at that time, I decided to start my own business and I was very blessed to have, in, in conjunction with Charlotte Reed, who was my business partner, but I was very, very blessed to be able to pick up the phone and call a lot of these authors that I had worked with. And our first client at the time was Victoria Rapp. So we started out with her. We had great success with her. And I had worked with the caucus for many years with Caribou. So after we closed, I, you know, I really thought about it and said, you know, I just really not would not want this to go away as part of the caucus. So I went to them and basically said, look, I can do it. And I had. Howard in the back of my mind in terms of a bookstore because I needed a bookstore to be a part of this to pull it off. So I had Howard University in the back of my mind to approach them and say, let's form a partnership that we can continue to do this each year for the foundation. And in addition to that, I had worked with Clyde, who he'll give you some background on his foundation, the Hurston Wright Foundation, and um, his whole history with literature I said, and called on Clyde to be a partnership, uh, to develop this partnership as well. So to make a long story short, Howard University came on board, the Hurston Wright Foundation came on board, and we were able to pull it off the next year with Flying Colors. That year we had 80 other authors. Last year we brought in Dr. Cornell West, Hill Harper. And the, the important thing that I want to stress in this is that you know, we're providing complete access to writers and the importance of literature and education. And a lot of the names that you see on our list, they may not be household names that you know, but the important thing about these names are the books that they write and the subject matters that they write about and the expertise that they bring. So, you know, we want to present to you a variety of authors, whether they be published with a major publishing house or whether they're independently published, because their work is incredible and they need an access, uh, access, we need access to this literature and a platform and foundation for them. So that's how we came together as a unit and partnership to um, make this formation for the caucus happen. Continue. Marita Golden, she has 14 books. She is the writer, I'm the bibliophile. She took $700 out of her pocket in 1990 and started the Hurston Wright Foundation. Our first award was for college writers. We went from there with an award for, we have the only award in the country for black published writers. So this is a venue where black published writers can come together and meet each other and meet the public. We also have the, the only multi-genre workshop in the country and the only award for college writers in the country. And this year we started a, a workshop for senior citizens, all you old folks, not me, all y'all old people. Uh, and our goal ba basically is to honor the black experience through literature, to preserve our history and our culture through literature. So we have a website, we're nonprofit, so we can always use money. We take checks, credit cards, or cash if you have references. Can I have reference cash? That's kind of tricky. Uh, but once again, and I also want to thank Patrick because he's been a stalwart this week to just stand here and keep this conversation going. Tell your friends next year to make sure they come back to Black Caucus. This is probably outside of Howard University right now. This is the largest 
black-owned, operated bookstore probably between here and Philadelphia. You're looking at it. There are over 3,000 books on this floor that they, they we bring in here starting Tuesday and put together. The question I asked a long time ago is, what is the purpose of black literature? Who gives a crap? Okay? And you know what the answer was? It goes all the way back to the book. You know the book I'm talking about? The Bible. What is the first thing in the book? In the beginning was the what? Word. Nothing happens on this planet until somebody says something. And a book does not have to influence everybody to be influential. So we have a, a, a responsibility to preserve this literature for the next generation. I'll tell a fast story, I'll get off this microphone because I've got something else to do. Around 1985, Bill Gates was on television, national television. The Bill Gates from Microsoft. He has just purchased uh, Batesman. Batesman is a, a company that provides stock photography for photographers. You know, if you want to see Nixon on the plane, you want to see you can go to Batesman. Bill Gates bought that company for $5 million. That's like me buying a stick of chewing gum or a pack of chewing gum. And I couldn't understand why he wanted this company. And out of his mouth, I wish I had recorded it. He said, with the technology that I have, I can control the future. And with these photographs, I can control the past. This was Bill Gates. So I'm still in love with the Kodak, the paperback, the book, with the board and the paper. Because online, you can change things. But when you got that book in your hand, nobody can change it. I don't want black books to become artifacts. I want us to be able to have a choice between e-books and the paperback version. The publishing industry is shrinking. We're losing black bookstores. So the question is, how do we take advantage of what is possibly an opportunity that makes certain that our literature is here? You can go from e-literacy we worry about, but I worry about e-literacy. You know how to read, but you don't read. And once that happens to us, e-literacy is inevitable. Our children are being trained that it is more important, speed is more important than immersive reading. Reading takes work, it's hard work. But we can, we must do it. We've read, listen, ladies and gentlemen, black people were legislated into illiteracy. It was illegal for us to read. So my question, I'll leave you with this question, who benefits if we stop writing and reading literature by and about African people? Who do you think is going to benefit? I'll leave you with that question. Thank you for letting me take this much time.